Okay, so uh, take yourself back to uh, 2011, Arab Spring. Putin sees the Arab Spring in a completely different way than the White House saw it and then a lot of the American press saw it. How does Putin see it? Well, I think like most autocratic leaders, uh, Putin saw the Arab Spring as a, a threat, as sort of a, a harbinger of potential things to come, both closer to home and then potentially in his own uh, country. And so I think, you know, popular uprisings tend to be things that uh, autocrats don't have a lot of sympathy for, uh, I think in, in large part because they worry about their own backyard. Uh, and I'm sure that was very much on his mind at the time. And inside the State Department and inside the, the White House, what was the sense looking over at Tahrir Square and, uh, and all the other places that are popping up? So I was at the White House at the time, and I think, you know, there were some mixed feelings, uh, depending on who you might have spoken to. On the one hand, I think there was a lot of uh, inspiration and uh, empathy and support uh, frankly, for people who were out in the streets taking uh, great risks to demand uh, basic rights that they had been uh, denied. On the other hand, this was happening in countries uh, that, in some cases at least, were close uh, American partners and governments with whom uh, we worked very closely on uh, some pretty sensitive uh, issues. So I think there was some concern uh, about what might happen to those governments and what might uh, follow those governments in the event that they were uh, replaced uh, by something else. Were there meetings you can place us in where people <clears throat> were concerned about on the one level, their own attitudes about it, and we're factoring in uh, Putin's response and what Putin would be thinking? So I think pretty early on, the realization that we had was that this was not something that was fundamentally about us, about the United States, uh, nor was it something that fundamentally we could shape in any meaningful way. This really was about the particular context in which it was occurring, you know, the, the sort of modern Middle East. So our policy response, uh, therefore, was really reduced to what we were going to say about what was happening. That was very much, <clears throat> you know, the main uh, topic of the discussion. How are we going to respond when asked, do you support what's happening? Are you concerned about what's happening? So most of the meetings that took place really were about uh, messaging, which is, you know, a big component of policy, but often policy discussions are about what you're going to do. Here it was much more about what we and, and, and even the president uh, would, would say about uh, the events that were transpiring. Was there an eye on Putin? You know, I, I'm not sure that Russia really entered into the discussion in a significant way. You know, obviously later in that year there were demonstrations in Russia uh, itself, and I think we paid uh, close attention, obviously, to uh, what was happening there. But I don't think, uh, just like this, uh, the, the Arab Spring events were not really about us, they weren't really about Russia uh, either. So uh, while that was maybe a second, third order concern, we were pretty laser focused on what was happening in the immediate period in those countries themselves. In general, how would you describe uh, around that time, the Obama White House's view of uh, then Prime Minister, but soon to be again uh, President Putin. You know, I think we were still in the period where the reset was uh, paying dividends. You know, we had um, gotten some work done with the Russians on Afghanistan, setting up this northern distribution network for us to be able to get uh, some equipment. Uh, into uh, Afghanistan, which was very important as an alternative to going through Pakistan. We'd obviously uh, historically and then would again in the future have some problems sometimes with uh, moving supplies into and out of uh, Pakistan. So the importance of having another uh, way into the country was uh, essential. Um, you know, it, uh, Russia was very involved in the Iran nuclear talks. Uh, they were one of the P5 plus one uh, countries and, and a critically important one because they also probably had the closest relationship with Iran uh, among the P5 plus one. So we really needed Russia uh, for uh, those uh, conversations uh, as well. And I think the general view at that time was, uh, you know, Putin was not someone who shared our values, and he's not someone who shared many of our interests, but he is someone who shared some of our interests. And so to the extent that we could compartmentalize the relationship, you know, oppose uh, things he was doing when they were opposed to our interests, and work with him when it was in our interest to do that, uh, we were going to try to make that work. I could imagine uh, when Putin steps back and becomes prime minister that there was a sort of sigh of relief, and I could understand the reset impulse. But when the word comes that, uh, that's not going to be the case, and that Putin is going back into the presidency. What was the reaction? Well, I don't think that took people tremendously by surprise. I mean, you should obviously go back and ask the people that were more focused on Russia at the time. I was uh, broadly uh, focused and, and more on the Middle East than other things. Uh, but my sense was, even when Medvedev was uh, 
you know, really in the driver's seat. People knew that uh, behind the scenes, uh, President Putin was uh, calling most of the shots, and that uh, Medvedev was in many ways a more palatable public face, but not exactly the decision maker on the big uh, topics that we were most concerned with. So, and I don't think there was a lot of people that thought that Putin was going to sort of go away quietly and gently when his term uh, ended. Take me to an understanding of what was happening on the streets of Moscow uh, once those protests uh, broke out and, and in all the many, many other cities around, uh, around Russia. What was the view from Washington of what that was and what that meant? So I think, you know, in part because of the Arab Spring context, we were really in a place where we did not know what the full limits of the kind of contagion effect of some of what had been happening in the Middle East might be. Would this spread throughout every country in the Middle East? Would it spread beyond the Middle East to sort of new uh, places inspired maybe by some of the events that were happening in Egypt uh, and elsewhere? Um, you know, I think it's a fundamentally different phenomenon in, in Russia than it is in, in other places, or at least a separate phenomenon. I'm not sure it was driven uh, as much by what was happening in the Middle East, although you know, I do think uh, seeing the effect of some of these demonstrations probably did lead people to believe that things were possible that they might not have realized or, or believed were possible before that. Um, you know, in terms of what was actually happening on the ground, I think, you know, the Russians have this view that we were somehow involved in uh, you know, organizing this, fomenting this, encouraging this. Uh, this is something that we hear to this day. Uh, and at least until uh, the conversations I had till I left uh, government in January that we would hear in almost every lengthy conversation with Russian uh, interlocutors that, that this was uh, an American transgression against uh, Russia somehow. That's fundamentally you know, not true, uh, but it is very much their view. I think we were much more observing uh, this and uh, trying to monitor where it might go and, and calculate what the implications might be for us and for the relationship uh, as opposed to us fundamentally driving this in some way. He gets it in his mind that Hillary it really sparked this, that yeah. yes, the democracy movement had a lot to do with it, yes, the web and the West had a lot to do with it, but she somehow becomes the object of his uh, lack of affection. What's that about? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm speculating. Uh, getting into uh, Putin's mind and, and psyche is uh, not something I feel particularly well qualified uh, to do, and I'm not sure uh, anyone is particularly well qualified to do that. But I guess what I'd say is she, so she's the, the face of the United States to the world. She's the Secretary of State, the most prominent public figure in our administration after uh, President Obama. And, uh, you know, the State Department promotes democracy. It is a, a fundamental tenet of our uh, foreign policy and has been uh, for quite some time, until recently when uh, the new administration sort of disclaimed uh, that uh, view to some extent. But this has been something that we do not just in, in Russia, but in the Middle East, in, in places all over the world, you know, with varying uh, degrees of success and with varying uh, tactics and, um, and ways of trying to go about uh, promoting democratic change. And so uh, I think because the State Department was so involved in those activities, funding training for democratic activists, uh, for political parties, and by the way, not in a discriminatory way. You know, the, when we operate in these countries, one of the, the first things we do is make clear that our programs and our trainings and these sorts of things are available to any of the political parties that want to take advantage of them. Now, it tends to be democratically oriented uh, certain types of, of parties and activists that want to take advantage of these programs, but they're not fundamentally discriminatory in, in, in some way. That is a, a basic tenet of the way we operate. But I think that, you know, President Putin uh, saw the way in which we were uh, doing these democracy promotions ac activities in Russia, like we did elsewhere, and felt like they were a, a threat uh, to, to his ongoing uh, rule, and, and so put associated Secretary Clinton with, with that. Okay, now could, let's go to 2014. The Socio-Olympics have happened, but there's been lots of action in uh, Ukraine. Uh, take me to the, the, the problems in Ukraine, the way that the uh, Secretary, uh, the way that uh, the State Department, the way that the President is perceiving what's happening over there, and, uh, and, uh, and, and start that ball rolling that's going to eventually, in February, turn into uh, the invasion of Crimea. So I think there are, there are a few things that are happening. One, Ukraine was uh, moving further in the direction of uh, completing an association agreement with the European Union, um, you know, essentially moving toward Europe in this sort of geopolitical uh, context. And I think fundamentally uh, the Russians and, and Vladimir Putin saw that as uh, a threat. Uh, you know, they see Ukraine as, as fundamentally in their sphere of influence. We don't really recognize, we in the United States, uh, that countries have these uh, spheres of influence. Uh, it's it's a, a, a 
a tug of war that we have with Russia in any number of places, with China, with some of these other large countries, but, but we deny uh, spheres of influence. We think countries should be able to make their own determinations about their foreign relations. And so uh, Ukraine was moving in this direction. I think there was probably uh, more of a zero-sum uh, approach to this association agreement on the part of the Europeans than uh, in retrospect may have been necessary uh, or wise. Uh, I think there was this sense of kind of with us uh, or against us, uh, and with us meant to some extent not with uh, Russia. I think Russia very much had that same zero-sum mindset to its relations uh, with Ukraine, offered incentives uh, to um, the Ukrainian government to not complete that association agreement. And in the end, uh, Yanukovych and the Ukrainian government decided to go the direction uh, of the Russians and sort of terminate that process uh, somewhat unexpectedly. That provoked a response uh, you know, in the Ukrainian populace, in the Ukrainian streets. I think there was a strong sense that Ukraine's future lay more with Europe uh, than it did with Russia, at least among a significant percentage of the Ukrainian uh, population. And so people came out and they demonstrated. Now again, this was not about the United States. This was not inspired by the United States. I think this was very much a, an authentic response uh, by a population to its own government's policy decisions. Uh, what I just described, though, I think is fundamentally incompatible with the way the Russians <laughs> saw what transpired. What did they see? I think what they saw, and they have said this to us in no uncertain terms, is a U.S. and European-backed uh, coup, fundamentally, against Yanukovych, or an attempted coup at that time against Yanukovych. Again, I, I mean, I can't stress strongly enough that was not our policy. And I think there's a lot of evidence for the fact that, that was not our policy. Vice President Biden was repeatedly, frequently, on the phone uh, with Yanukovych, not to tell him to go away, but to try to give him advice about what he could do to calm this down, to essentially get ahead of the demonstrations, what reforms, what steps he might be able to take to get this under control, because we were worried about uh, instability in Ukraine. And those uh, pieces of advice were not followed, not adhered to. And in the end, uh, Yanukovych ended up fleeing Kiev, uh, and then everything sort of started to come apart. But again, that was not at our urging. Uh, we were very much, at least as an initial matter, in a posture of trying to keep this under control. Can you give me a sense of who Yanukovych was? What's the, what's the short description of who he was? So again, this is something better left to the, the Russia experts uh, than to me, but he is a, you know, fundamentally an old style, almost Soviet style, uh, Russian uh, influenced and uh, uh, sort of uh, close to uh, Putin autocratic style leader. I mean, I think that is the way we, we saw him. That said, um, you know, this was not uh, a government that we didn't think we could work with, not a government that we had any policy desire to, to change. Uh, what happened happened, and uh, we reacted to it. Did you know, could you feel, could uh, Vice President Biden feel, uh, and uh, ultimately <laughs> Secretary Kerry feel that there was a kind of march to arms that were was beginning back then? I think we were worried about that. I think we were worried when, well, you know, there, there started to be, um, you know, security forces deployed to try to uh, put down this uprising. There were snipers, you know, out in the in the square. Um, and we were worried, you know, based on some of the things that we had seen in the context, uh, again, of, of the Arab Spring, that this could spiral out of control and end up in, in conflict if it wasn't uh, adeptly and carefully managed. That's what we were most worried about. Can I ask you uh, to describe any situations you saw or heard about with uh, Secretary Kerry and Putin? What were they like together? So uh, Secretary Kerry spent a lot of time with President Putin over a, a, a number of years. You know, we had two main issues that we were dealing with uh, with the Russians during the four years that Secretary Kerry was Secretary of State. One was Ukraine and the other was Syria. There was also the bilateral relationship with Russia, which is hugely important, and there are any number of issues that come up in, in that context. Uh, so I guess that would be a, a third uh, category of uh, topics on our uh, agenda. But uh, Ukraine and Syria were really, uh, first and foremost, the topics that were on both uh, sides' minds. And so we spent a lot of time you know, engaged in, in conversation to see if we might be able to find a, a common way forward on either of those two big topics. What was Putin like? You know, he's um, sort of more uh, soft-spoken than you might imagine if, if you hadn't uh, spent time with him. He is not um, brash in the context of, of these meetings, although uh, often the soft-spoken uh, tone and manner uh, is belied by some of the things that <laughs> come out of his mouth, which tend to be uh, highly critical of the United States, highly critical of our policy uh, going back years and even uh, decades, highly critical of our worldview. But they're sort of uttered 
matter-of-factly as if he is a, a sort of dispassionate analyst just providing insights uh, on the situation. This is what I hear, that he just, he starts up and he's got a litany of past wrongs and evils that he wants uh, to say that you kind of have to let him say. And yes, then... you end up having to uh, uh, deal with the what we used to call the airing of grievances at the beginning of, of every meeting. So you knew that the, the, the meat of the conversation was going to be about what I just described, Syria, Ukraine. Uh, but to get there, you had to endure a, a bit of a history lecture. And, and Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, Secretary Kerry's actual counterpart on the Russian side, who was a, another longtime uh, figure in uh, first Soviet and then uh, Russian foreign affairs, uh, is another uh, person who would subject us uh, occasionally to these uh, sort of lecture-style conversations. And I think Secretary Kerry had a good way of dealing with this. He would not concede the points. He would note where he disagreed, but he tried not to get overly caught up on debating the history, uh, because that's uh, not a debate that either side is going to win. And every minute that is spent talking about those topics is a minute you're not spending talking about the things that you're actually there uh, to discuss. So our sense was uh, to try to just get through that <laughs> storm as much as possible and get onto the things that we were actually there to talk about. What was the grievance list? So it's a number of things. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, most of it is ar around uh, the end of the Cold War and the immediate aftermath. So I think Interestingly, on the end of the Cold War, his grievances are much more directed uh, at Soviet leadership than they are uh, at the United States. I think he fundamentally understands the United States was trying to, quote unquote, win the Cold War, and that it was the Soviet leaders who may have kind of conceded that victory uh, too early. And, you know, famously, he has described the end of the Cold War as one of the great tragedies of the modern era. I forget the exact words, but that, that's the, the thrust of it. Um, with us, uh, I think it starts really in the way we handled uh, the aftermath of the Cold War. I think he fundamentally believes that the United States sought to humiliate Russia uh, in any number of ways, but principally, or at least one primary way, is through uh, the expansion of, of NATO, which is something he comes back to time and time again, and the expansion of NATO particularly right up to uh, the Russian border and Russia's uh, doorstep to the Baltics and, and other places. That he believes, and again, you know, people who know the history better can tell you this, but, but this was not always the way this was seen. Uh, in Russia at that period. I mean, there was talk at one point of, of even Russia potentially being uh, part of NATO. And that conversation, I think, even continued into the early years of uh, Putin's uh, tenure. You can get, you know, get this from people with, with a better sense of the history. But the way he sees this now clearly is that this was essentially an assault on Russia's sovereignty, on its security uh, by the United States at a time when Russia was weak and could not resist what the United States was doing. I think he blames us uh, for that. Then in the more modern period, uh, post uh, major NATO expansion, I think he sees the United States uh, support for, and in his view this goes beyond uh, rhetorical support, but, but actual sort of fomenting of, uh, color revolutions and other uh, examples of uh, regime change. And here he's talking about everything from uh, you know, the invasion of Iraq, which he sees as a fundamentally, and not incorrectly by the way, a fundamentally destabilizing act perpetrated by uh, the United States government to the color revolutions that took place uh, in some of the former Soviet states, which he sees very much, again, as linked to U.S. policy supported by, driven uh, by the United States. Now, moving forward to the Arab Spring, he sees the United States uh, having uh, used a Security Council resolution in Libya that he does not believe authorized fundamentally the use of force to justify uh, the use of force by the U.S. and Europe against uh, the Qaddafi government and eventually pushing aside uh, Qaddafi and, and replacing him with people that we, in his view, again, uh, saw as more uh, palatable. So, you know, he sees a pattern of these regime change type actions and policies, but the, the sort of coup de grace, the thing that, that really was, uh, I think, in his view, uh, the ultimate sin on, on our part was what transpired uh, in Ukraine, which, again, you know, we were not behind, but that is fundamentally not the way he sees it. So take me into a meeting or something where Senator or uh, Senator, where uh, Secretary uh, Kerry would try to discuss these things. How did that go back and forth between the two of them? They're sitting across from the table. Lavrov and others are all lined up. It, it's formal, I gather. Uh, uh, describe it as a as a former journalist describes. Yeah. It for so me. so with Putin, it would be uh, you know the. It, Large room, small table, very few people, so kind of grand setting, but, but not uh, a huge audience uh, for these conversations. They tended uh, to prefer small groups, and that was fine uh, with us as well. So just a few people on the United States side, a few people on the Russian side. 
during this kind of uh, history lesson period of the conversation, it would be mostly the Russian side and mostly the president uh, who was doing uh, the talking. Uh, Secretary Kerry would primarily be in uh, listening mode, um, noting you know, particularly egregious claims on the Russian side. He, I think, would feel obligated to say that's just not the way we see it. Uh, things that, that fell below the threshold of terribly egregious were probably not worth contesting because then you get into a back and forth that, again, eats up time. And uh, one thing about these meetings is, is uh, they tend not to start on time. You get summoned uh, to the Kremlin when the president is ready to see you. So sometimes we were, you know, an hour or two or more uh, behind schedule when we started. And you never knew exactly when he was going to say, okay, that's it, uh, the conversation's uh, over. So, you know, the, the big challenge in these conversations is to see how much of it you can focus on the things that you actually want to talk about and, and again, dispense with uh, some of the nonsense that you have to deal with at the start. So there's a real battle uh, in Washington and, and a real battle in Ukraine about lethal force and how much we deliver and what should we do? Could you articulate the, the sides in that in Washington? Yeah, I mean, what, what I don't really particularly want to go through, I'll let other people speak for themselves on this, is sort of who lined up uh, where. But, you know, the arguments are not hard to, to uh, describe. On the one hand, you know, you had a Ukrainian army that was being, um, you know, pushed aside by quote-unquote separatists who were really proxies of uh, the Russian military and, and even members of the Russian military themselves obviously infused into those uh, ranks in, in Crimea and eventually in, in the Donbass uh, as well. And they were outgunned, the Ukrainians, and we knew that. Uh, so on the one hand, the argument for providing them more training and equipment was uh, that otherwise they might be overrun. And, and frankly, this was a, a, a total mismatch in terms of uh, the ability to project power. Uh, even inside uh, Ukraine. So that's the argument for, for providing support. The argument on the other side is that, you know, you provide them with lethal assistance and with this training, and they are going to kill more Russians and Russian proxies. And then how is Russia going to respond to that? Uh, some people believe that if you, quote unquote, bloodied the nose of uh, the Russian backed side, uh, that they would be more inclined to back down. I think others believe that fundamentally if the Ukrainian side escalated the conflict and made it more painful uh, for the Russian side, the Russian side would escalate uh, in turn and then you're caught in this uh, escalatory cycle because if you back down then, then you've rewarded essentially uh, Russia's escalation and if you don't, you know, it's not clear where this ends. And so I think there were some people that were worried about uh, escalating this conflict, increasing the death toll uh, even beyond the sort of devastating level it had already reached. I'm sure the choices are, are anguishing for everybody involved. I know that where Merkel was. I know where Obama was. I don't know at all where Kerry was. Where was Kerry on this? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think Secretary Kerry was hesitant about providing lethal assistance to the Ukrainian side. I think at least at the in the early stages uh, of the conflict. As the conflict went on and as it grew more brutal, I think there were forms of lethal assistance that he would have supported and did support the co policy conversations. But beyond that level of detail, I would prefer he characterize his uh, position for you. Sure. Um, uh, your personal opinion about the idea that we've, we, we will have, by the time this is in the film, we will have made 45 minutes of uh, connecting dots that show a Putin who nobody has ever, who is slowly but surely building a force, building a cyber force, uh, upgrading his military, having the Gerasimov idea uh, alive and well. Um, uh, and many people say, we should have punched him in the nose right now to stop him. Otherwise, 15 and 16, the incursion in our electoral process might not have happened. So sorry, you're, you're asking, is the incursion to our electoral process linked to our lack of a more robust res response yes. in the Ukraine context? Yeah. I, I don't believe that uh, at all. I think what happened in our electoral process is uh, sort of the, the logical, more futuristic, more technologically enhanced continuation of what has been a longstanding uh, Russian effort to influence affairs uh, in the United States. But here they were, uh, on the one hand, more angry with us because of things that were happening in Ukraine and in Syria, and more capable of influencing uh, what was happening because of technologies that were at their disposal in this election that hadn't been uh, previously. I don't think this was uh, because we didn't respond aggressively enough on, on Ukraine. That, you know, there may be some people who think that. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So uh, once the, once the, uh, they're hacking, they're 
fake newsing, they're you know they're trolling, they're doing whatever they're doing, and by certainly by sixteen, Clapper and others know it's happening. By the summer of twenty. Yeah, summer of sixteen. Yeah. Uh, there are still some questions at the White House. There's still some questions at the State Department. What are they really doing? Uh, how far are they really going? Talk to me about your perspective from where you were about what was happening. And did you know, did you believe it was the Russians? My sense was that by the summer uh, of 2016, we knew that Russia had exfiltrated information from the DNC and from certain you know, high-level Democratic uh, political figures. Uh, I'm not sure I knew who the names of who they had taken this information from. I'm not sure if that was the kind of thing that was provided in intelligence reports or not, but we knew that they had gotten some of this information, and we didn't know what it was and assumed it could very well be uh, sensitive. At that point, we didn't know what they were going to do with it. It obviously was not the first time that Russia had attempted and succeeded, attempted to and succeeded in getting into sensitive systems, including U.S. government systems, including the State Department's email system, including the White House's email system, and all this has been uh, reported on. So it didn't seem at that point fundamentally different from some of these things that we had already observed. And at that point, I don't remember knowing, by the way, if this had been only the Democratic Party side, if this had been both sides. But the, the real thing that I think changed this from more of the same to something sort of new and more pernicious uh, was the disclosure of uh, this information, because that was a, a new step that we had not uh, seen. And then that led to all kinds of questions about what was behind this, what they were attempting to do. You mean disclosure by WikiLeaks or, what, or yeah, however? I mean, in the whatever you want to call it. it right. Fundamentally, Russia took the information, provided it to uh, you know, people who could provide it very directly to WikiLeaks. So I don't really differentiate in a, yeah. in, a, in a meaningful way between WikiLeaks disclosing this and the Russian government disclosing it directly uh, it's, itself. Now at the State Department, you're at the State Department. Yeah. This. So at the State Department, <clears throat> how? It's Russia. When do you know it's Russia? Right, I mean, almost again, right away. I, I, this is not something I can say with certainty, just because it was a while ago. But I remember, I think, it being indicated to us that this was Russia almost immediately after the DNC servers were hacked, and I think that was like June, July, whatever it was, of 2016. You know, there may have been, so, so there's always degrees of certainty with intelligence reporting. So it's possible that the delay was because they had to be, you know, ironclad sure of the attribution before they were willing to come out and say so publicly. But there was this very uncomfortable period between the summer and October of 2016, during which we were really not answering basic questions to the public in the State Department briefing and the White House press briefings about who had done this, even though there was a lot of reporting in open source. Uh, that Russia had been behind this. A lot of press reporting that Russia had been behind this, but we were not fingering them directly uh, at that time. Why not? Uh, you know, again, this is, I think, really a question for the intelligence community because... Yeah. Um, well, we'll ask them for sure. Yeah, I mean, in October, they they came out with their report. Uh, I guess it was, it was Homeland Security. Were you pushing? And, was there pushing from the, from the secretary? Uh, was there an imperative at the White House? Were you at meetings at you know, the White House? You know, it's... It, one thing you're not supposed to do as a policymaker is tell the intelligence people what conclusions uh, to draw. You know, political interference with intelligence gathering, intelligence analysis is, I think, rightly uh, frowned upon. So it's not like we were calling them up and saying, hey, you know, why are you not telling people what happened here? But I do think there was some confusion, and it definitely made our job more difficult because Secretary Kerry, our spokespeople, I mean, we, we had to be... An Again, one distinction with this administration is they don't put themselves out there in front of the cameras and in front of the press to, to answer basic questions very often. Uh, but we did that all the time. We did that almost every day. And uh, to not be able to answer these questions really, I think, did not serve us well. Well, especially in light of the fact that uh, candidate Trump says, hey, if it's, I don't know if it's Russia or not, I'm, I'm, but if it is, go get Hillary's emails, yep. right? That kind of stuff. What was your reaction to that, and, and how did that affect what, what you guys wanted to do? You know, to be honest, I, I think we tried to the greatest extent possible to not let what was truly a wacky campaign influence the way we conducted our business on national security issues. I can't tell you that that was 100 percent possible, but that was certainly uh, the goal, and I think it was the right goal. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that Trump's pronouncements about this really influenced at least the way we at the State Department saw 
you know, what, what was the right thing to do or, or not? There is, of course, the argument that we should have, as soon as <coughs> possible, certainly the White House should have insisted as soon as possible to get out there and say to people, this is a big problem. These guys are in our process and maybe get Hillary and maybe get Trump to stand there with him and say, hey, everybody, this is you know, really, really important. Yeah, um, so that latter piece, get, the get Hillary and get Trump uh, to stand I there, I think I is, is in the category of nice to wish for, but, but probably fantasy, uh, because I don't think you would have had at least one side of that equation uh, present and endorsing uh, that view. Again, in, an, in a more normal time, in a more normal election, maybe that's the kind of thing that's uh, possible, but uh, just given everything that's transpired since, there's nothing that leads me to believe they would have gone for that. Well, uh, so, so why didn't the <clears throat> president, by himself, push hard early? Do you have a sense? Look, I think it's a good and legitimate question. Um, and I think, on balance, the administration certainly, and I think the country would have been better served by making a clear declaration earlier. I don't think it necessarily needed to be uh, the president. Uh, you know, I think in some ways, separating it from political figures inside the administration and, and putting it in the voice of career professionals whose job it is essentially to protect the country from these sorts of threats gives it more credibility. Uh, you know, and I'm also now uh, in the context of an election in which uh, candidate Donald Trump was already saying the system is rigged, everybody's kind of out to prevent me from getting elected, using all sorts of illegitimate tactics, you know, the fix is in. Uh, for the president himself to have made a pronouncement like that, I think there was the risk uh, that it would be used uh, for political purposes um, you know, in, the, in the context of the campaign. And as, and as to Secretary Kerry, who's doing business, <clears throat> you guys are still doing business with the Russians, with Putin, uh, uh, fingering him, saying, you know, this is happening, uh, Mr. President, what are you going to do about it? Would that get in the way of any business you had hanging fire? So I've read people quoted usually uh, anonymously uh, alleging that you know, we at the State Department were against attributing this to the Russians or against consequences uh, for the Russians for exactly the reason that you described because it would impact uh, negatively our diplomatic efforts on Syria or Iran. I can tell you I do not remember a single conversation in which anyone at senior levels in the State Department argued that view. Uh, you know, there were sometimes questions of if we were going to do something, should it be right before we see the Russians at a very high level or right after? And our general view was doing it right before would mean that we were not going to get anything done in the, in the context of those meetings, so better to do it right after. But these were tactical questions about small delays. These were not sort of big strategic questions about should we respond. Everybody that I knew uh, who's, who's read into this and who was involved in these conversations at high, level of the, high levels of the State Department supported uh, both attributing it to the Russians as early as possible and responding uh, in a robust way. Is that right? Wow, good. Interesting. Um, the president, of course, pulls him aside, Putin aside. Yeah, and Hangzhou. What we know is that he said essentially, knock it off. Yeah, I mean, Probably a variation on that uh, theme with, with uh, more detail, but, but yeah, that I think was the thrust of the message. And the effect, the likely effectiveness of that? Well, I mean, I think we all saw what happened. Uh, I think, you know, on, on, the, on the one hand, uh, I'm, I'm, again, you should check the record on this. I'm not sure Russia continued to steal more information after that time, but they had already stolen quite a bit. They certainly did not stop disseminating the information that they had already taken. Uh, and then I think, you know, what these investigations are going to have to really dig into, the investigation that the special counsel is doing, the investigation, uh, investigations that are taking place on the Hill is, uh, how did Russia use that information? Because it was not as simple as putting it up on WikiLeaks for the world to see. There was a, a degree of targeting that went on on social media. There was a clear uh, interface between uh, Russian social media actors, both you know, bots and people, trolls, whatever you want to call them, who were uh, typing this stuff uh, up into, into Facebook and into Twitter, and then uh, cross over into uh, American media outlets, you know, usually starting in, in the right-wing uh, media ecosystem. And so how did that happen? Was that just pure you know, randomness? Uh, some of these right-wing outlets saw uh, some of the, the commentary by the trolls and decided, oh, that's interesting stuff. Uh, we're going to pick that up and, and use it. Or was there much more sort of direct interaction, direct conversation? And I think that's 
one of the things that these investigations are going to really have to ferret out. Any calls from Kerry? Kerry and Lavrov would talk. I mean, you, the way this works is you don't talk on the phone to somebody who's not your direct counterpart. So I don't think, I don't remember a single instance, I don't think it happened ever where the Secretary Kerry spoke with Pre uh, President Putin on the phone. Uh, but he would call uh, Lavrov his... Uh, his he speak with Lavrov about this? Yeah, he spoke to him about it in person. He spoke to him about it uh, on the phone. But they were, they were also talking a lot about both Ukraine and even more than Ukraine in 2016 uh, about Syria because uh, Lavrov was more involved in the Syria uh, policy uh, for Russia than he was in the Ukraine policy. When he talked to Lavrov, did he say, knock it off? No, look, every time we talk to Lavrov and every time we talk to Putin about this, and Secretary Kerry spoke with Putin about this uh, as well when we met with him, uh, they did not betray a quarter inch of uh, acknowledgement that they were involved in, in any way. I mean, they just denied it straight up. They lied to the secretary. That's uh, certainly the way I see it. Interesting. Um, uh, he wins. Trump wins. I recall. Uh, so um, let me let me uh, let me take us to. Uh, uh, let me take us to the transition. Okay. Uh, State Department. Yeah. Usual handoff of stuff. The usual, come on in, guys. Congratulations. We voted for the other side, but so here look, we go. I, I've never been through a transition before, so I, I don't have uh, authority to speak to what is usual and not usual. I will say, though, that based on what I've heard and what I expected, uh, it was not usual in the sense that there was no real meaningful transition to speak of. We left and they arrived, uh, but in terms of any sort of handoff on the way out the door, uh, there was not much. Secretary Kerry spoke once uh, with uh, incoming Secretary Tillerson uh, right after he was named uh, as the nominee. You know, probably talked for certainly under 10 minutes, not substantive. They talked about the possibility of maybe meeting up in Washington when uh, Secretary Tillerson, incoming Secretary Tillerson, arrived in Washington. That never happened. Uh, you know, the, the Tillerson side de declined to schedule a meeting. And, you know, Fair enough, that's their prerogative. But they did not meet face to face before uh, Secretary Tillerson came on board and before we left. Um, you know, I was Secretary Kerry's chief of staff. I never met my incoming counterpart uh, chief of staff. I was also at the end di director of policy planning. I never met the incoming director of policy planning. And, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, on the other hand, this was, these were not intended to be conversations where we tried to sort of persuade them on policy grounds, you know, sell them on the Paris climate agreement or the Iran uh, nuclear deal. These were intended to be conversations in which we tried to pass on advice about what might make their jobs easier. You know, here are some mistakes I made when I first got here that, you know, you might be able to avoid if you know in advance uh, that they'll be coming. And uh, I certainly had these conversations with people when I got to the department uh, and, and was starting in my job. I found them useful. I know Secretary Kerry spoke with, I think, just about every living Secretary of State, former Secretary of State, before he came on uh, as Secretary and found those conversations uh, useful uh, as well. But, you know, they made a different decision. Here's, a, here's an administration. Here's you guys dealing with a president of Russia. Yeah. Clearly an enemy in lots of ways, maybe waging a certain kind of war that could last and last and last in the United States of America. Here's an incoming administration that A, doesn't want to talk to you about your perceptions and your deals and your worries and the things that might have worked with this foreign leader, but actually are talking about loosening sanctions. Your reaction to that? Yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure I linked these two things at the time. Uh, I'm not sure we had a, a detailed understanding of whatever it was they were conversing about uh, during that period, uh, at least I didn't. But, um, you know, I think we saw this much more in the context of a very contentious, deeply polarizing uh, campaign uh, and a highly charged partisan atmosphere in, in Washington. I think that was the sense that we had as to why they frankly didn't want to have much to do with us. Now, in retrospect, you know, looking back on what we now know, at least based on media reporting, you know, there may have been more uh, going on there. Um, but at the time, I think we just saw this as, as you know, a, a function of our really broken politics. Okay, so I'll ask you what they didn't ask you. Yeah. Which is what you know about Putin, from what you know. <clears throat> um, 
Ukraine, all the things you know. Uh, their new policy of rapprochement, whatever it is, their idea of not taking this very seriously, uh, this cyber invasion of the American election, electoral process, um, what would you say if you could say it to them about how they should approach this problem? Well, look, I, I think that this is something, this problem is something that, you know, we say this a lot, but this is an area where it's just fundamentally true that this transcends politics. In some ways, this to me is not even really about partisan politics. This is about a new threat to the country and really to our core sovereignty and our democracy, you know, things that whether you're Republican or Democrat, you should consider vitally important uh, to the United States and should seek to protect and to defend. And one of the things that I think a lot of us who've come out of the administration have been saying since we got out is that this is not a tool that the Russians used once and are going to sort of put back in the toolbox, uh, nor, by the way, is it a tool that they are only going to use against one American political party going forward. Uh, they have clearly identified a way to cause us harm uh, and to influence our uh, system. They have honed this tool both in the United States and in many other countries, uh, primarily uh, in democratic contexts in Eastern and Western uh, Europe. They have continued to use it uh, since uh, our election in, in France and in Italy and, and are continuing to use it in, in Germany uh, and in Scandinavia and other places uh, today. And they are continuing to use it here and will continue to use it here in our 2018 elections and 2020 elections. So the question really is, do you consider this important and dangerous? I don't see how you wouldn't. And if you do, you know, then we really need to get to the bottom of what actually happened, not to revisit the outcome of the last election, which is the way the president always caricatures uh, the investigation. They want to undermine my electoral college vi victory. It's not about that. It's about protecting the country going forward. And we can't do that unless we know how we were damaged uh, in the past. And given what you know about Putin, the schoolyard bully, the whatever you want to call him, the guy with a lot of grievances about the United States of America, is it time to push back? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think we should have done more, frankly, to push back while we were still there. I think there were probably some uh, you know, good reasons, good intentions behind the decision not to take more uh, assertive steps. But absolutely now, uh, given what we know, and again, I'll, I'll remember that the intelligence community came out with an opinion in early October that basically said Russia did this, but didn't really say a whole lot about why. Then in January, you know, there was another uh, intelligence com community uh, release, all of the agencies uh, signed on to, uh, that suggested they were trying to influence the outcome of our election. You know, at that point, I think, starting early January, it was almost too late for the, for the outgoing administration to take uh, significant action. At that point, you know, the ball was sort of being handed off uh, in real time uh, to the new administration. Um, they have not shown, uh, it's an understatement, uh, a lot of interest in responding to this. And I think uh, what's interesting now is you're seeing Congress uh, uh, start to finally, I think, realize that uh, this administration is uh, dropping the ball a bit in terms of its response and, and maybe starting to impose a, a response on them. There was, you know, just today. And, risk talking about this because uh, this is obviously going to be a project that uh, doesn't see the light of day for, for some time. But today, Congress passed uh, uh, sanctions uh, legislation uh, on Iran and on Russia. And some of the most aggressive uh, sanctions uh, that we've seen in the context of Russia uh, in quite some time. And you know, we'll see if the House passes this and ends up going to the president. Then we'll see if he signs it. But I think, uh, and it's a good thing, that Congress is starting to get fed up with an action here and, and maybe start uh, forcing the administration's hand. Mike. I want to go back to this question about if everybody at the State Department was <coughs> saying we need to go public, we need to do something strong, this is in the summer and fall. What happened? What were, you know, what were the options? Why didn't anything happen until late December? So I think a, a few things. I think until the intelligence community was willing to put its imprimatur behind uh, the opinion not the opinion behind the fact that Russia had uh, taken this step, it was very hard for anybody else to make that claim. Because, you know, if the White House and the State Department went out and said, we believe uh, Russia did this, you know, question two, three, or four would have been, uh, does the intelligence community endorse and support this view? Is there intelligence behind uh, what you're saying? And so until uh, 
you know, the, the opinion was buttressed by intelligence, it was very hard for us to talk about publicly. Um, in terms of, out, and again, you really, you, you got to ask these guys why it took, I think, as much time between June and October, because they will probably say uh, att attribution in these situations is complicated. We wanted to make sure we got it right, given the high stakes. You know, I'm, I don't want to speak for them, but that's probably what you'll hear. In terms of our response, um, you know, it was interesting. Our thinking was uh, there were a number of ways in which we could respond uh, to what Russia did. The most obvious in some ways would have been a sort of proportional response in kind uh, in the cyber domain. So, you know, they took information from us, they disseminated that information, it uh, influenced our system in ways that we didn't like. So what, you know, what we could have done is, is done something comparable, something similar to them. Uh, we are certainly a very capable and adept uh, country on, on cyber issues. I think the downside of that response is that we did not believe that this was the kind of behavior that we wanted to uh, endorse. And if we responded to them in exactly that same way, at least implicitly, it would have implied, all right, you know, it, this is now a new way of doing business, and you know, you're going to do it, and we're going to do it, and uh, we have now established a sort of a new guideline uh, for behavior that this stuff is acceptable. We wanted to establish the opposite guideline, that frankly, this was unacceptable. So that's one reason not to respond uh, with cyber. Another is that, you know, unfortunately, our comparative advantage over Russia in this space is pretty limited. And, you know, arguably Russia has a huge advantage. Not that they're better at cyber than we are, but that we're an open society. We don't control all of the information, and for, you know, for the better, we don't control all of the information that is provided to the American people. Russia is not an open society. The Russian government has the ability to really control its own information space. So our ability to do to them what they did to us, frankly, is pretty limited, even if we are more capable uh, than they are. So I think we thought a cyber response maybe was not the best way to go. We obviously were not at that time, and I think, again, for very good and obvious reasons, ready to go to war, you know, physical kinetic war with Russia uh, over this issue. So that really left what we say, messaging, and then uh, economic steps, economic sanctions. Now, I think one of the things that we at the State Department thought would have been wise was steps where we really had a comparative advantage on economic sanctions. I think we had shown in the context of Ukraine that we could take economic steps that hurt uh, the Russian government and that hurt individuals close to President Putin without you know, upsetting the global economy, without hurting too much our partners in Europe who do a lot of business and a lot of trade uh, with Russia. And there, here was an area where we had an undeniable comparative advantage. We are an, you know, almost immeasurably stronger economic actor uh, than Russia is. Russia is an economy that is hurting in the best of times, and we showed an ability to hurt them more uh, through the sanctions that we put in place in the context of Ukraine. So I think it was a long way of getting to this, but I think what we thought would have been appropriate was making stronger statements and taking stronger steps in the economic space. But it didn't happen. But it didn't happen. Why didn't sanctions happen until late December after the election? You know, there were a lot of policy conversations about what we were going to do to uh, respond. Um, all I can say is these ideas were presented, they were not decided upon. Uh, and, you know, we got to a point, I think, in, in early December where it seemed like we might not respond at all uh, to what Russia had done, other than sort of what the intelligence community said in early October, uh, saying what we knew. And uh, eventually, mid-December, uh, and then culminating in, in the actions that we took in late December, we finally did decide to take at least some uh, action. Some action uh, on sanctions, some action in terms of expelling uh, Russian diplomats, some action in terms of closing, you know, their two diplomatic facilities, uh, sort of retreat facilities in, in the United States, in, in uh, Maryland and, and New York. Uh, pretty limited response, uh, actually, but uh, was it better than doing nothing? A absolutely, it was better than doing nothing. But pretty limited. Pretty limited. When, when Trump becomes the president-elect and he's talking about you know, Russia not being that bad, questioning <clears throat> the intelligence agency's assessment from October, what was the feeling inside uh, the administration? There's reports of, you know, concern that intelligence may be destroyed and uh, that, that Russia may not be held responsible for. What was the feeling in that transition period about the president-elect and, and his approach towards Russia and towards the hacking? So, I mean, I know this has been reported, and uh, so there probably are elements of, of truth there. I do not remember 
at least again at the State Department, us being worried that somehow all this information that we had gathered would like go away and people wouldn't see it either in Congress or in the administration that came in. Um, that doesn't mean there weren't people that thought that way. That was not something that I think was on our radar of things to be concerned about. But his attitude towards towards Russia, were you concerned he wouldn't hold, that was there a concern about he wasn't going to hold what their the feet to the fire? His approach was going to be a feeling like he needed to, to get to them. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think we were worried about a lot of things. I think we were worried about uh, the prospect that they would, you know, immediately lift the sanctions upon uh, coming in. I think we were all also, from a very early stage, concerned about NATO. You know, I think we were concerned because of some of the things that the president-elect had said during the campaign. You know, NATO is uh, obsolete. I mean, hard to imagine more uh, pleasing music to, to President Putin's ears than uh, disparaging comments by an American president-elect about uh, NATO. And yet he had, uh, he, President Trump, President-elect Trump, had said these things. And so I think we were concerned about NATO being undermined at exactly the wrong time, at exactly the time in which Russia was behaving more aggressively, uh, not less aggressively, when our NATO allies, uh, particularly in countries uh, like Ukraine that were on the sort of Russian uh, border and in this area uh, that Russia considered its sphere of influence, were increasingly on edge about whether the United States and the alliance would sort of be there for them uh, if, if things really went down. And exactly at that moment, you had uh, the top uh, uh, leader of the United States uh, calling this further into question. I think we were very concerned about that.